Good morning, welcome and welcome to our UNICEF Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. I am Marita Perceval, UNICEF Regional Director, talking to you to present you our report on equity in health 2016. It is an immense pleasure for me to introduce the 2016 Regional Health Equity Report that UNICEF and Tulane University have jointly developed under the umbrella of the movement A Promise Renewed for Latin America and the Caribbean. For UNICEF, this report represents an important contribution to what lingers as our biggest challenge in the region, despite the amazing progresses made in the last two decades in improving health and nutrition indicators, reaching their reach given equal opportunity for a healthy start of life to every person in the region, independently of his or her socioeconomic situation, education level, gender, ethnic, and race. Latin America and the Caribbean, as you know, is a region of peace, governments elected democratically, with active and vibrant social movements, without ethnic, racial, or religious conflicts that put at risk its sense of community, its important multiculturalism, and the richness of its biodiversity. This is a region that, in the past two decades, as I said, has made significant socioeconomic progresses with positive effects on the well-being of millions and millions of children and their families. And although Latin America and the Caribbean is a region that every know and then is affected by economic vulnerabilities, deep depth of dignity and justice, by norms and mechanisms that breed violence and perpetrate poverty that coexists with intolerable levels of impunity, that suffers from the uncertainty of tilting politics that do not always allow facing new challenges. Although all this is still happening, that doesn't mean that tomorrow will be the same. And for this, we are here. Inequity leaves deep and painful footprints in the life of millions of children and adolescents in our region. It also summons us to work together to draw new paths, paths more egalitarian, free and fair, so that no boy, girl, or adolescent and teen is left behind. The inequities in health are unnecessary unavoidable and therefore unjust and a first step to fight against them is having the data well clear on the reality data for better know data for better understand data for act together data for change now of this luisa brumana uh, our advice on regional health will speak better and more on this important report. Please take the floor, Lisa, and thank you. Thank you very much, Marita. Thanks everyone for joining us. It is really great pleasure, honor for me um, to be here and present the 2016 Health Equity Report. This report is a product of a long effort by many. Uh, real teamwork across UNICEF here in the region, but also uh, by our colleagues in headquarters, which I want to thank uh, in this opportunity, as well as with uh, a number of dear partners. Initially, the need for this report was discussed and agreed uh, within the Promise Renewed for Latin American and the Caribbean group that Marita also referred to, whose executive committee includes uh, apart from ourselves in UNICEF, the Pan-American Health Organization, USAID, the World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank. 
Furthermore, and apart from this core group, I would say, this movement incorporates a number of other stakeholders, including other UN agencies, uh, government, civil society, academia, as is the case for uh, the colleague from Tulane University here, and the private sector. The aim of this group is to help reduce inequities in maternal, uh, neonatal, child and adolescent health in the Latin American and Caribbean region. For this, the main objective is that decision makers would have uh, updated evidence on inequities at regional, national, but also subnational levels, and that they use this information to adapt and adopt their policies to reduce health inequities more effectively. We believe that this health uh, equity report is a, a contribution to this objective and uh, an important one. It highlights what the situation is, but also it highlights when and where the information is probably not enough, uh, providing also recommendation for a further evidence generation agenda. And furthermore, and maybe most importantly, it calls us all to learn, reflect and act. Without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, the main researcher of the report, Dr. Aracho Castro, who is here with us. Uh, yeah, with us. Arach is the director of the Collaborative Group for Health Equity in Latin America of Tulane University, and uh, she will present us a summary of the result. Before passing the word to Arach, though, just a, a logistic information. As we are live on YouTube, uh, we the transmission suffers for some seconds of delay, so if there are any questions arising from the audience, please do type them and we'll make sure that we collect them and we'll respond uh, at the end of the section in the question and answer uh, part. So, Aracha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, UNICEF, for inviting me to, uh, for being here and uh, share the, uh, some of the findings from the, from the um, report. And um, I hope that uh, you will all have find easy access to it. The report is divided into several chapters, and uh, it has a chapter on um, reproductive health, a chapter on maternal health, neonatal health, child health, adolescent health, and implications of violence on health equity. All these, um, all that is included in the report is our topics that are often seen in other places, but here what we have done is to analyze all of these uh, different aspects that are um, that are shown here from an equity perspective because it does require a different type of analysis. So next one, please. And first, I, I, it is important to understand what is the difference, what makes a health difference, a health inequity. So, and what is not uh, considered inequity. There are differences in survival and in timing and frequency in the onset of illness and disability that have not known social economic causes that are more biological in nature. And uh, however, what makes a difference um, inequitable is when it, it, is, it stems from social and economic inequalities and that they prevent individuals and communities from achieving their full health potential and uh, in a manner that's, that is systematic, avoidable, unfair, and unjust. And that is the most uh, used definition. And I wanted to emphasize the term avoidable because that's what Marita Perceval was mentioning earlier. We are analyzing these health inequities knowing that they could be avoided and that they can be public policies that can be developed to avoid these large inequities. And uh, what the report Report does to establish that a difference is actually uh, inequitable is to understand the causes and the mechanisms of uh, inequity. And that's um, for that purpose, next one please, we have um, uh, combined two types of analysis. There's a quantitative analysis which is, consists in the uh, analysis of data from household surveys from more than 20 countries in the region. And uh, we, there is also a review, an extensive review of the literature that I conducted along with my wonderful team at Tulane University. 
and uh, where we have reviewed uh, more than 700 sources in Spanish, Portuguese, and English in a way that they could help us understand what are the causes and the mechanisms of health inequities. Next one, please. Here on the left is a list of indicators that we selected um, together with uh, UNICEF uh, to uh, conduct the quantitative analysis. And uh, on the right, we have the stratifiers. That means those are the variables that we have used to disaggregate the data and identify whether they are where and how large those differences uh, are. And the stratifiers that we have used are wealth retire, rural or urban residents, education level, and when available, uh, ethnicity, which is actually an area that deserves much more attention. And uh, when uh, analyzing health of the child, we also looked at uh, the sex of the child. The next one, please. So here we have on top four of the main um, indicators for socioeconomic position that we have used to understand inequity in the utilization of health services and in the quality of health, health services. So on the one hand, the quantitative data allows us to understand to, uh, the difference in the utilization of health services, but um, oftentimes that data doesn't allow us to understand the quality. And we have analyzed the quality by revising all these many studies that have been conducted on the region. And uh, we find that systematically, uh, ur uh, rural residents uh, being in the first quintile, not having education or only primary level, and being of an ethnic minor minority explains uh, lower utilization and lower quality of care in uh, different aspects of maternal, reproductive, and child health. And here at least just a few, but those are access to contraception, safe abortion, detection of, uh, of uh, early detection of cervical cancer and breast cancer and treatment, and uh, also during pregnancy to have at least uh, uh, four prenatal visits and being tested for HIV and syphilis and receiving appropriate treatment for the woman and preventing the transmission, having skilled birth attendance, or to have, when necessary, a cesarean section. We've also looked, for example, at, um, uh, we, we found differences in the percentage of children whose birth weight is reported, uh, whose birth is registered, and who receive, for example, postnatal care. So those are only some of the interventions that we have analyzed and that consistently are show inequities in across the region. The next one, please. We also looked at health outcomes. And in health outcomes, what uh, was very interesting to find is that rural or urban residents didn't make that much difference in many countries, in most countries, except for Bolivia, Guatemala, and Peru, which are the countries with the highest percentage of indigenous populations. Uh, in the rest of the region, there are not, there's not a clear trend that neonatal, perinatal, neonatal, infant and under five mortality is large in rural areas. On the contrary, in some countries, it is even higher in urban areas. And one of the explanations is that poverty in urban slums can be so uh, harsh that uh, that would help explain why mortality could be actually higher in urban settings. We also found a similar um, issue with adolescent pregnancy, which is even though data, uh, if we look data quickly, we may see that it may be higher in rural areas. Actually, when we analyze it by level of education, uh, we see that it can even be higher in urban settings among the poor. Um, but again, Wealth quintile education and ethnicity were the major socioeconomic factors that explain inequities in health outcomes. Next one, please. For example, here we have gaps in met, in, uh, met need for contraception. So we actually have here the, um, we have three different graphs and that is, uh, you can fully uh, find that in the report 
um, and I just want to explain what these graphs mean because it may be a little difficult to see it now on YouTube. But we have on top, on the left, um, the unmet need for contraception by country that have data and uh, along wealth quintile. So we have in the middle, in orange, a dot that reflects the national average. And then we see a vertical line that shows the distribution between the extremes, between the poorest and the wealthiest. Therefore, the longer the line is, the, the larger the inequity in that country is. And uh, we can see, even if we're not paying that much attention to it, that the lines, so the gaps and the inequity, the inequity is larger in a net need for contraception when it comes to wealth quintile and education. The gaps by rural or urban residents are much smaller. And uh, despite the fact that uh, fer fer fertility has steadily decreased in the region since the 1970s, we observe that inequity still persists and that uh, there are greater needs for unmet need among the poorest and, uh, and uh, also um, there are higher rates of uh, contraception discontinuation and greater use of unsafe abortion. Next one, please. When we look at, at having at least four antenatal care visits um, during pregnancy, we observe similar differences, but here we see that the inequity, as you can see on the left, that is wealth income and um, education, the, the lines are very large in certain countries, that means the gaps are very large, and uh, when it comes to rural urban residents, there are fewer inequities between rural and urban. And in the region, we, we oftentimes can be uh, glad to know that at least more than 80% of women who are pregnant receive at least four prenatal visits, which is what was recommended until very recently, now it's eight. But um, in most countries, more than 80% of women have at least four prenatal visits. However, we cannot uh, we have to challenge ourselves because when we disaggregate the data along socioeconomic position, we find great inequities in uh, access to at least four prenatal visits. And um, the, one of the big, big importance also of prenatal care is that women who usually receive more prenatal care visits are those who are more likely to have a professional skill attendance at birth. Next one, please. Here's skill birth attendance. Uh, we have identified very large inequities, both by wealth, I mean, by the four stratifiers that we use, wealth, education, rural urban residents, although smaller they are in some countries are extremely large. And we also found data on ethnicity. And we find that across in all countries that have data by um, indigenous and non-indigenous populations, that skill birth attendance is much lower among indigenous women. Next one, please. In terms of the quality of uh, the reproductive health care that women receive and ethnicity, there are not that there's there's not that much information. However, we, there are enough studies that show that um, indigenous and Afro-descendant women have worse health outcomes and lower utilization of health services. And um, the majority of the studies have been conducted in Brazil, and uh, in all of those, it shows that Afro-Brazilian women are, receive poor quality of care, they're, for example, less likely to receive the recommended number of prenatal visits um, or, or the uh, recommended examinations, and uh, compared to women who are not of Afro Brazilian descent. And uh, that is, um, it's very worrisome um, on the one hand, because we see that there are lots of, there is a process of social exclusion in the uh, provision of health care, but also it points to the fact that the fact that there are not that many data that mostly comes come from Brazil shows that the reality is much 
uh, words that we currently know, but the data that are available. And therefore, we need to understand that problem in much more depth. The next one, please. Maternal mortality, there is a great variation. Usually when we think of maternal mortality in Latin America and the Caribbean, what is discussed is that uh, as a region did not achieve the uh, MDGs that were expected. Uh, some countries did much better. Um, there is a great, there are great differences between, um, I mean, between countries in the region. And uh, however, it is very difficult to find data that are disaggregated by socioeconomic position. Also, interestingly, when we compare the region to other regions in the world, we find that hypertension and abortion are causes of death at a much higher proportion than in other regions. Um, and uh, in part is uh, in the case of abortion due to the fact that it is uh, criminalized in many countries in the region. Next one, please. Here's a neonatal mortality rate. Uh, there are very large differences being uh, Cuba in one extreme and Haiti in the other. And uh, about half countries in the region are above the regional average. And uh, when we explore the disaggregation, next one, please. Next one. Here, uh, the neonatal mortality rate, we find that uh, there are Again, as I explained earlier, the largest uh, inequities are explained by uh, wealth quintile and education of the mother. And in certain countries, the neonatal mortality rate is three times as high among the poorest and among the wealthiest, and three times as high among the uh, children whose mother has no education compared to those who have secondary or higher education. Um, and again, except for uh, Bolivia, Peru, and Guatemala, where mortality is higher in rural areas, in the rest, in the other countries, it is really the differences are small and it can be even higher in urban settings. Um, the next one, please. We, here we see uh, the uh, infant and under five mortality rates in the region, and uh, similarly to neonatal um, health, neonatal mortality, uh, there are great uh, differences within the region, between countries, and uh, most of the uh, under five mortality in the region is due to neonatal death. But uh, again, uh, when we look at the next one, please, we find here similar patterns to the neonatal mortality. And uh, for example, the differences between the poorest and the wealthiest children and uh, those whose mother have no education and those who have secondary or higher are in some countries up to uh, 71 um, um, points. For example, we have here one country that uh, it is actually Bolivia, where the difference in the if the national average, the national rate is around 50. We see that um, among the children whose mother have no education, it is about twice as much. And therefore, we are. And again, it is precisely in Bolivia, Peru, and Guatemala where the infant mortality rate is higher in uh, rural settings, but not in the, uh, in the rest of the region, which makes it very, very interesting and actually points us to the fact that uh, urban poverty may be uh, one of the main contributing factors to those mortalities. Next one, please. In under five mortality, we again, uh, we find uh, the similar patterns that we found in neonatal and infant, and obviously there are uh, related to three indicators, and uh, I'm going to go on to the next one. This is about stunting, and um, the widest gaps in stunting are by wealth and education again. And uh, we do have in the region a country with high uh, prevalence of stunting, and that is Guatemala. 
And in, for Guatemala, we actually do have uh, ethnicity data and uh, among indigenous children, stunting is 66%, which is twice as high than among non-indigenous children, which is at 33%, still very high. But we see here how stunting is twice as much among the indigenous children. And uh, going back to the other indicators, we see that uh, stunting it is across the board much higher among the poorest than among the children whose mother is not educated. And uh, it does have a tendency to be higher in rural areas, but again, the gaps are much shorter. The next one, please. In terms of uh, child marriage, it is still prevalent, very prevalent in the region. And uh, we have here data for women who uh, were in, in marriage or union before the age 15 in, in uh, blue or 18 in red. And uh, this is very worrisome because um, there are more uh, child marriage is much more frequent in context of poverty. And uh, the, those percentages have not changed much since the 1980s. And adolescent girls in, in formal or informal unions have less social education and economic opportunities. And um, it also creates economic and legal insecurity. And that unions, uh, those unions are associated with gender-based violence and lack of autonomy. Um, uh, girls who are adolescent girls also in informal unions have a higher probability of uh, contracting sexually transmitted infections and of becoming pregnant. And that leads us to the next slide. Next. Where we see that when we look at the percentage of uh, pregnancies that are among adolescents, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is the world champion. And uh, if the the, uh, it is about 17% of pregnancies in the region are among adolescents, and the world uh, percentage is 10%. And um, girls who have no education or who have not uh, completed primary education are those who are more, have higher probability of uh, being pregnant. And uh, some, and it happens in many different ways. Sometimes. It is uh, the pregnancy that actually prevents the girl from continuing education, and sometimes it is the reverse. It is the, uh, uh, the girl who uh, oftentimes, because of issues of poverty and lack of expecta life expectant expectations about opportunities that lead her to become pregnant. Obviously, that also in a context where sexual education and sexual and reproductive health services for adolescents are usually lacking and um, um, the adolescent pregnancy is also higher in the next one please uh, among uh, indigenous and afro-descendant uh, girls next one please here we see the reg regional average and again we see great differences between countries in the region next one but again here the most important explanatory factor for adolescent pregnancy is education but also wealth has a very large gaps, great inequities, and um, but again, it is um, it is consistent. There is a pattern, and uh, that pattern is not as prevalent. However, when we compare urban and rural, the next one, please. When we look at uh, data, we see that those differences that are show that adolescent pregnancy is more prevalent in in rural areas. Actually, when we look at education, we see that the differences are not that. Uh, large between urban and rural settings. Next one, please. In terms of violence, we um, Latin America and the Caribbean has the one of the highest prevalence in the world when it comes to sexual abuse of girls and of emotional abuse of adolescents. Uh, sexual abuse is uh, more prevalent among the poor and those who have low levels of education and uh, also among uh, LGBT populations. And uh, sexual violence increases the risk of, of exposure to, for example, HIV, 
infection or pregnancy and uh, mental health disorders. And on the other hand, pregnancy is also increases the vulnerability to sexual violence, which uh, also sets up um, higher probability of developing chronic stress, spontaneous abortion, low birth weight, neonatal mortality, and other obstetric complications. Um, and to end, I'm hoping, I really invite everyone to look for the report, to uh, uh, read it and uh, find information that hopefully is going to allow to understand much better than uh, that what previously um, our national averages have done because the report offers the possibility of understanding who is being left behind. And uh, we hope that it will guide policy making by allowing to find who and why are left behind and where the resources should be concentrated and how the strategies should be targeted to improve the health conditions of these enormous amounts of people who are below the national averages in, a, in, in the region that is most unequal in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Arachu, uh, for presenting us this key and results, and I would say sober result, result. I add to your voice um, in, in uh, stimulating colleagues to, to read the full report, which I think is much even much richer than what was presented today in, in this short time. Uh, before we go to the panelists that we have, um, we would like also to show a short video. Uh, where we have some testimonies uh, that were collected in the work with the Promise Renewed, just to, for us to remember that uh, statistics uh, are not just numbers, they are faces beyond those. Um, so please, uh, let's, let's have a look at this video. es una cuestión estructural y se mira en todos los estamentos del Estado, en lo público, en lo privado. Se piensa que las personas que viven en las comunidades rurales, que son mayoritariamente indígenas, como que necesitan menos, como que se enferman de otras cosas. No es que esa discriminación exista solamente en los centros de atención. Es una exclusión y discriminación que ocurre en la sociedad, pero que en los centros de atención se refiere específicamente y donde tiene unas consecuencias en resultados de salud directos. Especialmente porque son servicios rurales, eh, por eso muy distante, que no genera eh, el tipo de exposición mediática que sí genera un hospital urbano, en el cual rápidamente los medios de comunicación recogen problemas de falta de medicamentos, de acceso, etc. Fue ahí en el centro de salud que dijo que, ¿qué es esa niña? ¿Por qué está gritando? A mí no me gusta, me da dolor de cabeza, entonces pues, oye, no me gusta, esa niña está para afuera. Bueno, va uno, ¿dónde viene? Va uno a ir a la clínica, no, ya no lo van a atender uno. Entonces, pues, cuidado, pues, hay un remedio, pero no lo dan. Pero no lo tratan igual, hay una discriminación ahí entre ellos. Tenía el niño desnutrido, no lo atiende, estaba hinchado y él me dijo que ese niño estaba bien. Y yo le dije, bueno, este niño no está bien porque este niño no es gordo. Yo me lo llevo para casa y el niño se me muere en la casa. Ahorita que estoy así, casi le dije a mi esposo de que mejor no ir porque en la forma de que lo tratan a uno, mejor no ir. Eh, mejor tratar así nada más, eh, especialmente pues con un doctor. También humilde, se pasan con eso. A veces las alegan, les tratan mal. Y eso no debe de haber así. Hay eh, centros de salud donde crean una sala específica para lo que se le llama parto intercultural. Y entonces eh, la mujer puede estar ahí, puede disponer de algunas de las herramientas que pueden utilizar eh, si ella hubiera dado a luz en casa. Se trata de evitar el parto horizontal, que va eh, en contra de la ley de gravedad. Todos vivimos quejándonos del Ministerio de Salud, que el Ministerio de Salud no provee los servicios, que no tiene la cobertura necesaria, etc. Pero 
También sabemos que el Ministerio de Salud apenas recibe el 1% del Producto Interno Bruto. Cerca del 40% de los trabajadores de la salud tienen contratos temporales, ahora ya no son contratos permanentes, sino que han la educación de sus hijos, casa, no genera como satisfacción en el trabajador de la salud. Pensar que quizás lo contratan y quizás no, y encima le empiezan a pagar en marzo. Entonces, con todos estos matices, se está el escenario listo para que la gente no sea atendida también. Una posible solución a este problema es pasar este nivel que mencionaba, en el cual hay una tensión, hay un conflicto entre el Estado y el prestador, a que ambos trabajen en conjunto y se vean que ambos son las víctimas del sistema y continuando esta tensión, esta, este abuso, este sentimiento de trato, de trato no digno, no llevan a ninguna parte y se tienen que trabajar en conjunto. Well, we've now seen this video, and, and then now from uh, the testimonies of uh, the people uh, that we just saw, I would like to introduce two panelists uh, for this section. Uh, the first is Dr. Andrea De Francisco, the director of the Family General Life Course Department of the Pan American Health Organization of PAO. Uh, after which we will have the honor of having with us Dr. Rudolf Cummings, uh, the program manager for health of the health sector development of the Paracom Secretariat. So without further ado, uh, Dr. De Francisco, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you are hearing me well. Yes, perfectly. Go ahead. Great. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Percival, Rumana, and Dr. Castro. Thank you very much for this opportunity for us to comment from the Pan American Health Organization on health, the Health Equity Report 2016. The director of the Pan American Health Organization is unable to be with us, but I'm conveying her messages. <clears throat> health is influenced by a complex interplay of physical, social, economic, and cultural and environmental factors. And this is very clearly reflected, <coughs> excuse me, in the report that has just been uh, launched. We have to consider this in reflecting of the lessons learned from the Millennium Development Goals. The MDGs were very important to gather traction and attraction to issues of women, newborn, and children, as well as adolescents, to a certain extent. But perhaps what was missing was this element that actually the development agenda that has we see in the post-2015 is talking about working in a more intersectorial manner, because health is more intersectorial. And that calls to tell us that the era of averages of measuring averages is finished. We really need to start looking at how does health look for specific subgroups of the population? What can we do in an intersectorial manner? Multidisciplinary and intersectorial partnerships will require will be required more than ever in order to be able to help achieve optimal health and health being. To make sure that in the post-2015 agenda, we will put people at center, or people who put themselves at the center, we have to make sure that these efforts are balanced with indicators of the advancement and well-being of each human being, including material, social, cultural, and spiritual dimension of human progress. This report is providing us with some very essential information. And it's giving us a diagnosis of what is happening in the region. A lot of the presentations show about outcomes, show about what differences subgroups of the population are dealing with and the inequities between them. And therefore, it should help us guide future action and interventions 
focusing on specific groups of the population. And I think in that sense, this report is helping us move forward. How shall we do that? And I will refer to one of the opportunities that we had. As you may be aware, in September 2015, during the United Nations Sustainable Development Summit, a new global strategy for the health of women, children, and adolescents, health, 2016-2030, was launched by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. The global strategy is building on its earlier version in 2010 by focusing on equity as a driver for global health and sustainable development, and by also adding adolescents, which is a very important group of the population, as this report is actually showing. Following the global strategies launch, a corresponding operational framework was presented to the, during the 69th World Health Assembly and approved by all WHO member states. Mirroring the global strategy, the operational framework also highlights the need to tackle health inequities. The resolution specifically talks about inequities adversely affecting, affecting outcomes of women, children, and adolescents, especially among those who are more marginalized, are affected by discrimination, or live in underserved communities, particularly in the poorest, least educated, and those living in remote areas. Accordingly, the global strategy advocates policies and programs that are equity-driven, gender-responsive, and human rights-based. So this is basically calling us to work on these inequities. In addition to recognizing the importance of addressing these inequities in health, the operational framework sets out to offer assistance and options on how to translate global strategy into sub-national strategies and plans, building on existing country processes. And it's very clear countries are in the driving seat. This needs to be structured and implemented through the structures that exist in countries. One interesting feature of this strategy that relates uh, in a way to what has been presented is that it has a series of targets which are under three axes. One is the survive axis, the second is the thrive axis, and the third one is the transform axis. Together, these targets seek to end preventable mortality with the survive axis, promote health, well being, and development through the thrive axis, and expand enabling environment through the transform axis while focusing on reducing inequities. While the surviving axis is traditionally linked to health and responded through the health sector, all targets can only be achieved through the collaboration with other sectors, including finance, education, social development, gender. In order to ensure that the global strategy targets are met, regions and international agencies around the globe have come together to start developing roadmaps for the implementation of the strategy within specific contexts and providing the support that is required. Supporting the region of this new endeavor, the agencies that form the Promise Renewed for the Americas movement will be, in the next couple of months, aligning the movement's ongoing work on reducing health inequities to the global strategy, as well as initiating processes for implementing a series of regional and national level activities that have as an overall objective to facilitate the interpretation and the implementation of the global strategy in the context of the Americas. This will include the formation of an intersectorial technical group, implementation of a regional meeting to inform multi-sectorial operationalization of the global strategy in the Americas, and perhaps more important, the implementation of a series of national 
and local intersectorial consultations to bring the views and identify opportunities to pursue from all national stakeholders, as well as the subsequent implementation of a high level meeting to obtain commitments by agencies and institutions representing different sectors, similar in the way that the first global strategy raised the advocacy part and increased commitments from governments, both political, technical, and financial, towards the health of women, children, and adolescents. By moving as one, extending beyond the traditional approaches in the health sector, the agencies part of the promise renewed for the Americas, including PAHO, UNICEF, the World Bank, the ITB, and USAID, as mentioned, are hoping to ultimately support the region in accelerating its progress towards universality and health equity and meeting the goals set forth in the global strategy. As well, I might add, set forth in the sustainable development goals, which are around the same time span. Thank you all, and we look forward to a continued cooperation to make health and development for all women, children, and adolescents in the Americas a reality. Many thanks, uh, Dr. De Francisco. Uh, I'll pass uh, the microphone now to Dr. Rudolf uh, Cummings from the CARICOM Secretariat. Dr. Cummings, welcome, and the story is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Are you hearing me? Yes, we yeah. can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, let me apologize, first of all, for not joining the uh, the consultation on time, a, a little bit of technological problem. Um, in fact, I am actually speaking on my phone because my computer did not figure out how to speak up. But uh, this is an opportune time for me to make a few comments on the document which I looked through on the issue of inequities. I think that in particular, in the Caribbean, some of our countries, the ones in, uh, on the South American mainland, as Guyana and Suriname, have specific problems with inequities as is identified in the documents. And I think the document takes time out to identify that data is actually collected, I believe it is in Guyana, based on ethnicity. Part of the problem in the two countries, Ghana and Suriname, is that the indigenous population lives remotely in relation to the main centers of health activities, and therefore their access to the full uh, the, 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 the full range of care uh, for all the age groups that you have looked at is somewhat not as adequate as those who live in the more populated centers. However, there are other uh, in the document, I think, warrant uh, concern from Caribbean policymakers and health professionals. In particular, the fact that in some of our larger countries, we did not attain the MDG 5. And in fact, the meeting I am attending right now in Jamaica has participants from a few of those countries and we're specifically looking at these issues and trying to detail approaches which can help us to significantly lower what has been considered maternal mortality too high for our region. I am informed that the UN goal of 70, the, of ratios of 70 per 100,000 are attainable by CARICOM countries, well, with the exception of Haiti, quite easily. And in fact, we should be pushing to attain 30 per 100,000. I am certain that the reason why the CARICOM Secretariat is beginning to get involved in these activities is because it is believed that there is need from, for some level of political awareness 
to this lag which exists in our region for attaining these goals. Uh, and therefore, this, this particular meeting I am at, we will leave here with some sense that both at the local level in the countries as well as at the regional level, there is a need for more political support, which invariably we believe can translate into more resources and to have specifically targeted interventions, which can help to reduce these, uh, <clears throat> these attainable goals which have been set for us by the SDG pro uh, process of 70 per 100,000 and even further, based on our per capita incomes to 30. Now, of particular concern, I know for, in relation to our region, and this was said in, your, in the initial presentation, is the high levels of adolescent pregnancy. This is something that colleagues have spoken to. One of the, clearly one of the issues um, that I think is an issue is the high level of uh, inequity in the population, in the general population. There are huge income disparities, and this further translates into disparities in relation to education for both girls and boys. And even though in this region we boast of high level, higher levels of education for girls than, than boys, this may in and of itself be part of the problem that this, this lack of education in a segment of the adolescent population does not bode well for reducing <clears throat> this high level, these high levels of, uh, or higher than usual levels of adolescent pregnancy. But there are structural problems, in particular, the fact that we do not have the enablers which enable our adolescent population to easily access contraception or, or sexual and reproductive health services. This is in need of a significant level of advocacy among uh, opinion leaders in our communities, both political as well as the, the, um, the NGO community. There is a resistance to allowing adolescents to use health services without the supervision of their parents. And I believe there is work to be done in that area. Uh, the Secretariat has tried its best, I believe, and will continue to try doing the necessary advocacy in the various groupings to ensure that there's a better understanding of this issue in terms of adolescents being able to access services independently. Um, there, as, as you may or may not be aware, um, only three countries in our region, there is reasonably, reasonable legal access to termination of pregnancy services. Here is an area where I'm not going to say that there's a need for advocacy, but where be some consideration of approaches which can help in particular the poor to, when necessary, have access to emergency services as may be deemed necessary. There's a lot of work to be done in this area. Again, there isn't at this juncture in time the necessary political um, astuteness to move this issue in a direction which can enhance the health of women. But there is nothing, we can achieve nothing without trying. I want to thank the framers of the document. I think there's a lot of good and handy information for uh, policy formulation. And certainly in the meeting that I am at, some of its tenets have served us over the last two days very well in formulating conclusions to the end of this meeting. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cummings, to bring in the perspective of uh, the Caribbean, which is, of course, very important and very relevant to the discussion. Um, without uh, trying to really uh, attempt to summarize the wealth of, of information that we have uh, received from, from uh, Rachel, but also from our panelists, I just would like to, to draw a few, few key points that I, I, I noted. Um, first of all, I think we are saying this report is the first step, an important one, but we really 
call us uh, to what else uh, is important and required uh, in terms of more information, more disaggregation of the information, more regards and better regards to social, structural uh, and cultural bottlenecks that create these inequities uh, and not just to the effects. Um, and of course, to a better uh, use of uh, the information and inequities to really uh, change uh, policies so that uh, nobody's left behind. Uh, we also heard um, from Dr. De Francisco the importance of anchoring our efforts to uh, the global um, uh, framework that we have, in particular to the Secretary General Global Maternal Neonatal Child Adolescent Health Strategy. But also, I think I heard from all the presenters the importance to look at the regional specificity um, and how we can make sure that this global framework is relevant uh, to each and every one of the countries of this region. Finally, I think uh, we, we heard that um, there is an agreement that given the data and the situation, um, all of the above is a needed and urgent task and that everybody has a responsibility at political, advocacy, technical, and social levels. With this attempt, um, I'd like poor to summarize, I'll pass the word to the UNICEF uh, Latin America and Caribbean Regional Director Marita for... for well, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, Ayatu. Thank you for your contributions, distinguished uh, professors and the director of the Department of Family, Gender and Life of the uh, Pan American Organization of Health and also the very important participation of Dr. Rudolf Cummins uh, sharing with us the challenge realities and perspectives of the Caribbean region. Uh, well, so thank you once and again for your presence, participation and a strong commitment in terms to really achieve the, the goals of this promise review. Uh, for, for me, uh, as regional director of UNICEF, uh, briefly I would like to, to share with you a very simple message. Uh, let us remember in all our actions and all our decisions, uh, three substantive principles and criteria. Firstly, the powerful principle of the best interests of children and adolescents. Secondly, the universal inter interdependent and progressive nature of human rights, human rights for all, without exclusions, without discriminations. Thirdly, the imperative the political and social imperative that is a will. This imperative is the will for leaving no one behind. This is a promise renewed, but also is the promise that the international community last year, September 2015, adopted unanimously as our horizon, the horizon of our sustainable development. Under this framework, we understand and uh, recognize that we can, for example, eradicate poverty, eliminate discriminations, and guarantee for all the people, particularly children, adolescents, and women, the enjoy of human rights. Because it's not a concession, it's not a, right, a, a favor, it is the basis of our social contract 
the present of a human being and the future of the planet and the people. Thank you so much and I fully appreciate this moment sharing with you a promise renewed. Thank you.